Hello everyone, welcome to the 11th episode of TCLF one-on-one. Through the one-on-one series, we aim to interact with the best legal professionals from India and around the world. Today, we have a very special guest with us, a, a world-renowned name in the field of intellectual property law, Professor Irene Kalbuli. Professor Kalbuli teaches at the Texas A&M University School of Law. She's also a fellow at the University of Geneva, a transatlantic fellow at the Stanford University, she has been a visiting professor at multiple universities, including the world-renowned National University of Singapore, uh, Singapore Management University, and, and the likes. Uh, as far as her scholarship is concerned, I, if, I, if I were to name out her publications, it would take me a list to do so because of the extensive nature of those publications. Ma'am, it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining us. So, um to everyone at the Contemporary Law Forum, uh, the pleasure and the honor is mine. Thank you very much for having me with you um, today. And uh, of course, your introduction is uh, way too kind. Uh, um, it's just, you know, my my pleasure to be able to, um, you know, be useful to many students like you. And, um, you know, India is a dear place in my heart. I have many uh, former student, many friends, many many senior colleagues from India, and um, so you know, unfortunately, we cannot really be uh, together in person. But I have a special affection for your country, so thank you again for having me. Uh, again, I'm it's an honor. Just to begin with the interview, I'm just set the tone for the conversation. Can you briefly describe your journey in the profession, or what made you choose law, and was academy always the plan? Well, you know, as everything, um, things happen a bit um, by chance, but uh, chance uh, or luck uh, is when opportunity uh, meet the preparation in many ways. I grew up um, in a family of academics. Uh, my dad is a professor of classics at the University of Bologna. Uh, now is is emeritus. Uh, my mom uh, is a professor of history of rhetoric. But law uh, runs deep in my family. My, grand, my, my great-grandfather was a magistrate and actually one of the first judges in the anti-mafia tribunal um, from, you know, from eventually in Sicily. But he ended his career as um, a magistrate in the Cassation um, Court, the Court of Cassation. And uh, my great-grand-uncle as well. Um, I've always found the law um, I stumble a bit into the law because I, um, like many people, I'm, I'm from Italy, so I studied my undergraduate in Italy. Uh, but uh, my high school, like many people in Italy, I, I did the liceo classico, the, the classical um, lycée education. So, you know, we study a lot of Latin, a lot of Greek, um, a lot of history, a lot of philosophy. You know, of course, math, physics, but you know, the, it's really very much a classical education. You know, logical thinking, and uh, law was very much a natural path from that, because law to me it's a mix between real life, because of course, you know, law it's about regulating, um, you know, behavior in society. But there is a lot of logical um, thinking about it, and uh, and uh, and so I see often the law as, um, at least I was seeing the law when I started more as you know playing chess. You play rules. You understand the rules. You question the rules. You understand the history, the etymology. You work uh, by by arguing the meanings of a certain word in context and so on and so forth. Then of course, you know, the more the older you get, the more experience you have, you realize that re there's really policies. And so sometimes it's the end rather than, you know, the, 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 the nuances of every specific words that really should matter. But my choice of law was, first of all, because I was 18 when I went to university and I really didn't know what to do, like many people. You are too young. And so my main advice to young people is you need to understand what you don't like. That's the number one thing you need to understand. What you really dislike to do. I never liked physics. And so I, 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 I was more, you know, uh, trained as a, class, as a classicist. And, and, uh, and, and so law was more natural. But also law as an undergraduate was very broad. So then you can 
find your way a bit and, uh, and understand better. I also was, and here's my main advice to people, particularly young people, find good mentors if you can. It's really difficult to find good mentors because you need to find people who care for you, who take the time uh, to, to listen to you. Uh, but I was very fortunate to have uh, some extremely good professors in my, in my university. And when I chose intellectual property, back then was industrial property, I really chose my mentor. I had a major passion for conflict of law, international private law, um, and I always love criminal law. I really enjoy studying criminal law, but the professor, all my professors were great, but the professor that was um, uh, the professor of commercial law in, in uh, uh, industrial property was really a gem, was, was somebody who was dedicated to teaching, there for their student, for his student. And, um, and you know, he took me under his wing. He really showed me how to be a better scholar, how to be, um, you know, to keep up high standard. And he invested a lot of time. And so that for me was, was really the path, you know, the choice. And after I graduated, I did my bar exam. Uh, and my professor um, sent me to the United States for a year at the University of California, Berkeley, back then, uh, when, you know, intellectual property was barely existing, was the years when TRIPS was negotiated, was 1994. And then I did a PhD also under the, sa the, the direction of the same professor. And so he really helped me and he guided me throughout my, my early career. And then when I finished my PhD, he was the one suggesting, now you go to England, I did an LLM, first a diploma, and then an L, uh, a premier, and then an LLM at the London School of Economics. Again, because my professor really believed you have to get broad um, um overview, you have to think, you know, and back then was when Europe was harmonizing laws, trips were just been adopted, the world was really opening up to intellectual property and trade, when industrial property and copyright merge became intellectual property. And the rest is history. Once I went to the UK, then uh, um, after that, I had a bit of the, the choice. Should, do I, uh, I practice? I decided I wanted to go back to practice. I did my bar exam before and I've been always doing all the mandatory, um, um, you know, training. But I really never practiced 100%. So I spent a bit of time, not a lot, because I knew I wanted to be a, a professor. Um, and, but I need to understand how practice works a bit better to be a better professor because I'm training lawyers. I'm not just training, you know, once upon, the, you know, once in a while academic. And, uh, um, and so for me, that was really a bit the path was, and, you know, again, luck is, I repeat, is when preparation meets opportunity, but sometime, you know, I think I jump on things I liked very much IP. I like trademark law. I was very interested by geographic indication. I started back then was the years when there was a lot of rulings in the European Union about parallel importation. Mm -hmm. And so I started to work on exhaustions of rights as well. And, um, and then I went to the United States completely by chance, you know, for family reason, really, but because I had already all these international prime uh, through the EU was and paradoxically easier to find a good job in the US, which is a country that gives people opportunities. Still, you know, it's maybe in a bit of you know a state of flux right now, but it's still a country that gives talented people lots of opportunities. And um, and then um, you know, and then after that, I've been there for many years, and and now I live in Asia. I've been living in Asia also, you know, initially for family reason, but that that has opened a lot of other doors. Uh, you know, working with WIPO, working with the community here, working with India, working with South Asia, working with China, Japan, Korea. And, you know, life is a bit of a journey. You go, you adjust. But my main suggestion is find the mentors, find people who care for, understand what you don't like first, because um, that's really important. And then you narrow down and things change. And don't be afraid to make mistakes, because no matter what, you need to readjust. So you try a bit and then adjust. But try, try, good, try to find good mentors. Also, when you choose, good mentors are very rare. Uh, and they're, they're more and more rare because everybody runs around what they are doing. A uh, few people take the time to try to give back. 
And that's really something really important, I think. And find good friends, good, you know, my LLM friends, I was yesterday on the phone with one of them. Um, uh, they are really, in many ways, my community. No matter where we are in the world, we are together. Uh, they are the people you can turn to for an advice um, um, or, you know, find good colleagues that you can trust and ask about things that you might not know very well so you can, you can, you, you can get better advices. And then go a bit with the, with the flow. Um, try to have a strategy, but also be, be smart and flexible in your strategy because ch things change. And now, more than ever, things change very fast. I think, you know, the fact that we are here online, this pandemic is a great example. I mean, this pandemic is a disaster for the world, but it's also a lot of opportunities. The fact that it's bringing, paradoxically, people more together when people, they are more apart. Uh, technology has been a blessing. Um, you know, many parents say we shouldn't uh, be, uh, you know, on the computer or uh, too much electronics, but imagine now without electronics. Um, and so again, is how the, you, we can use the tools uh, for, for what's best for us. So I've been lucky in my career, but I, you know, I keep trying to reinvent myself uh, also because it was boring and, uh, you know, to be able to speak to young, smart, and the leaders of the future like you guys, it's what really is exciting for me. Well, I, I think that you pointed out a very important thing that to find right mentors is very important, especially in the legal profession. This is all about mentorship, right from the practice stage. For any advice, I think mentorship goes a long way in the profession. Uh, and taking cue from your uh, one of your uh, statements, you said that you mentioned uh, you practiced law for a few years before delving into the academic part of law. So, like, what is the importance of uh, you know practical exposure or practical uh, of this of of having some kind of a practical experience in the legal profession for academics or for professors? Well, I think you know, as as everything, it's always a matter of balance. Um, it's really important, in my view, for good academic to understand practice and to understand policy. Um, it's also important to develop theory and to not be stuck in practice because at the end of the day, practice is most about success and money. Uh, in intellectual property, you are going to defend the clients or small clients, but it's all about damages and remedies and, and you can't really develop strong theory and theory is crucial for policy advancement and what's right and wrong you know i mean the fact that company x wins the case might really be wrong for the policy rules um even though as a lawyer you have the duty to do what's your best by the interest of your clients so for me it was very important to understand better practice but i also understand not you know i am a lucky one um not you know, not 100% of graduate can become a uh, professor and maybe not, m m many don't want to because, um, you know, like every job has its pros and cons. So also to be an academic is, you know, it's considerable cons beyond the faculty meeting with the colleagues. Uh, it's really sometime, you know, it's, um, um, it's not as dynamic. And I think practice is important because it gives you that edge and it makes you understand what matters. And at the end of the day, practice carry the world, but theory should inform it. And so it's it's how the two can really, um, you know, closely work together. I think, in my view. Just to continue, I was mentioning that uh, you know this practical exposure acts as a bridge, so that students can understand the theoretical parts in its application because the professor has actually been there, and you know they. It, he or she can describe to them that okay this is how it works out there and this is why this policy matters so i think that's very important uh, and, and you know and i think now in, in in more and more in law school when i went to law school it was very theoretical you know we were studying right. books and 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 i think now experiential learning and experiential teaching clinics are really becoming not just a US, you know, the US I think has really started this trend, which is an excellent trend. But now clinics, mood courts, uh, um, hands-on work is becoming far more common 
across the world at undergraduate level too. And that's, it's really important, I think. And I think it's also really important for students, the fact that a lot of the teachers in law school are just not the full-time professor, but the adjunct professor, because the adjunct professor brings a lot to the, to the table for students, mostly in terms of experience sharing. They've been working on a deal, you know, that afternoon and then they go teach but also in terms of connection, because you know, students need a network to actually find jobs and connection. And I think this experience, a mix between adjunct teaching and experiential learning, it's really important. And today the profession and the professional teaching, it's uh, being shaped differently. And I think that's really good. There's been resistance, there's been resistance by by the theorist about too much practice is actually bad. And again, it's a balance. You need to have doctrinal teaching. You need to push your student to think. But remember, um, no, you know, you need to have both. And so theory informed practice and practice informed theory, that's really is constantly a circle between the two. You, we, we cannot think of one without the other. And so for students, it's truly important to understand a bit of practice and also to have some taste. You can taste a bit of commercial law, a bit of criminal law, a bit of employment law, and understand what you like and what you don't like. And, uh, um, and the people, you know, in some of the cases you might be involved too. So I think this is really, and you know, India, like the States, or we are common law country. So what do we study? We study through case precedent. And case precedent is the law in practice. And you know, and then how we decide, of course, that a matter of rule of law, or you know, uh, so um, you know, the novel review, or you know, it's a, it's a matter of law, it's a matter of fact. But at the end of the day, it's really the law in practice as it is applied by the courts and argued by the by the lawyers. And so I think that's, that's something that we, we should always keep in mind. Right. The balance is extremely important. Now, if you were to describe an effective method that you have used in the past to you know, facilitate uh, classroom discussions, what would that be? What do you do when you realize that, okay, so the students are finding this stuff, so what should how do you invent that method or just improvise? Well, you know, I mean, um, to teach it's uh, is, is a learning process and it's never ending. And the other thing it's, uh, um, you know, our field is very dynamic, so we change all the time. And sometimes the most important thing is to know that I have understood, you know, particularly some of the new technological development. Um, how can I sense my student? At this point, you know, I think I've enough experience. Um, I try to create the most conducive environment. My classes are non very competitive. I really want to create an atmosphere of collaboration. Uh, we start class with everybody introducing themselves, um, telling something personal about themselves, you know, it's trademarks. I want to know what's their favorite brand, why, um, something that can then help relating examples and them remember each other well. I tend to make my student really empower active learning. And so I really want them to, I don't want to lecture too much and I want them um, to tell you know, the basic principle. And, and, and in this way, I can sense, did they understand it? And if they don't, then I fill in. Uh, but I also want really to make the point that they're learning from each other um, uh, because, you know, some people are very shy and so you need to push them to speak. Other people are not shy, so you need to teach them how to listen. And, uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I think again, and each class is, is, has its own personality. Um, I really love to teach because every time it's a bit a different process, you know, some things are similar. Um, but every class has its own personality. And uh, uh, it's really important, you know, I think at this point to keep the, and, and this sense again, this sense of community, the, the classes are your classmates and the, the interaction that we have with each other, you know, you have your, your, your class with your classmate will be the, the people you carry on in your, you know, in your profession later. And I think, um, that's that's something that we might remember. And so the better atmosphere, 
serious, but also, you know, since we spend a lot of time doing what we do, you know, the more pleasant it is, the better. So I'm trying to check on my student, do they understand it? And I also very carefully don't allow one or two people that I know are good dominate because you really want to hear by those who are shy and silent, did they understand? And, 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 you know, and so again, that goes perhaps with experience, you learn how to manage, you know, the class and I have, I have no problem in telling people you just quiet, the other one speaks now. I mean, you know, to be in control, it takes time, you know, it takes time to develop the, the, the you know, in many ways, the ability and, uh, you know, I, I see many of my young colleagues, you know, when you start, you're afraid, oh my God, my student and what they think. And in the US, you know, there is also, I don't know if in India is the same, but, you know, student evaluation are a bit an instrument of torture because if the student don't like you, then you don't get tenure. And so everybody's afraid. And so, and, you know, once you get tenure, then the good news is you run the show, they are there, they're going to learn, they're going to study art. And paradoxically, the more the higher the standard you have with your student, the actually the more they respect and the more they like you. Um, and that's the way I personally I'm not there because they need to like me. I'm there to teach them and to try to challenge them, to push them, them, and then they will understand, maybe not there, but you know, and one week, a month, a year, three years, that, wow, that was useful. And that's the most important thing. Um, you know, I, I, an old professor of mine would say, I'm not here to make any new friends. I have enough friends. I'm here to teach you guys. And, you know, I have extremely high expectation for myself and so for my students. Otherwise, not fair and it's a waste of everybody's time. Right. You, you mentioned already, uh, very important point that uh, you, you know classroom discussions can go a long way in bringing home a point. Everybody gets to learn if the environment is conducive, as you mentioned. So that I think is very important. Now I think you know if you were to focus on these discussions, that although the virtual model of education has ensured that classes or the learning keeps going and it's it does not you know fail face a barricade in terms of learning. But I think the thrill of classroom discussions has subdued because of this entire virtual model of education. So what, what do you think about this new model, which we have been forced to enter into many of us? Uh, so what are your views on this? Well, um, you know, at the beginning, as everybody it was a bit of shock because we, we had to migrate online like in no time. Um, I, w I had a, a bit of a better experience because my classes for the, the, the winter semester, for se the, the spring semester had already finished. So I didn't have to jump into the middle of the class um, online. I uh, started to, I had to do several um, classes for some of the masters I teach to, um, you know, through the WIPO system and, and, and other system. And so those were like, you know, three days, two hours. And, you know, um, and it was okay because you can deliver your lecture. The most important thing is really to try to recreate a sense of community. So ask students to keep their camera on if possible and try really not just to lecture monotonously with your slides. But then I taught a whole class. I do volunteering work for uh, the, the, the Royal University of Law and Economics in Cambodia. And, and that worked out extremely well. Um, you know, 20 people class work out extremely well um, throughout a whole week intensive. We did over 15 hours of teaching over a week. And again, it's about you, you don't do too much, you stop, you ask, uh, and then there is a bit of a break, perhaps, um, you know, community builders such as, you know, a virtual coffee. Um, with the University of Geneva, we did uh, the, the WIPO University of Geneva Summer School Online, and that also worked perfectly well. And the same, the Digital Law Center Summer School. And, and those have been all well done. But we, we plan as a team ahead quite well, and uh, we put a lot of time in trying to think carefully. I mean, what are, so to, how can we replicate the best of real life 
um, taking advantage also of the fact that through online you can reach people a lot across the world. We had, you know, people from breakfast in Brazil to uh, midnight in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, I, we could all be together at the same time. How can you take the best of this experience and then bring it in so you can still have a sense of community? It's easy uh, when I'm meeting with my colleagues that I know very well, whether we meet, as long as we see each other, whether we meet on, on, on Zoom or we meet in person, is really the same right now. Um, because we know each other, the dynamics are there. The real challenge is when you don't know the class, when you have 100% different new people. And so I think it's really important to spend the time to make sure people introduce themselves, um, people are there, you check, you will be slower because you don't have the same cues that you can have when you have people in front of you, you know, body language speaks, are they tired, are they not tired? I'm, and, and, and so I think some of these, but there has been a lot of, in my view, a lot of positive, of, you know, again, there is nothing positive about COVID, but um, it's, it's positive to be able to connect with more people and to be able to bring a bit of a different format. I tend to be a positive person. We need to look at reality and trying to spin it towards whatever is the advantage of it. So we have no choice. We have to be online. We have to do the best we can, and uh, and trying to be happy about it and still have a, a personal, fulfilling experience. The screen times is more tiring. So again, it's important to remember perhaps uh, to have more breaks, to have a bit of asynchronous teaching. You know, like I, I have my uh, I'm going to teach comparative law in the fall, so some will be little movies or little recording um, and uh, and uh, um, and so um, but I think I'm very happy in the way this whole pandemic has been working out in the sense that I think the world and technology allow us to cope with it in still an imperfect but you know satisfactory way for our job. It's not, again, it's not the same, but it's, it's a good surrogate. And we need to try to be positive about it. That's, that's, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Exactly. I, I think the best part about the entire situation is, is that this um, virtual model has ensured that people get the best of opportunities, which otherwise they wouldn't have for example, in a people or students in India, they can actually they were actually able to attend the Vipo Geneva uh, Intellectual Property Summer School because I believe that Vipo has an India Summer School as well. I think it was organized in MNL in Nagpur last year, and they were able to attend that. But uh, a lot many people who couldn't attend that and were you know dreaming for attending a Vipo Geneva School, they were able to attend that because of this entire virtual model. So I think that is an important thing that the access has improved so yes yes and in fact you know we were thinking about even when COVID-19 will hopefully be over should we continue to have some of these because you know because of access because travel expenses are too are too much and not everybody can um, um, you know afford it and uh, you know I have uh, um, you might know I'm the 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 I created, you know, uh, also with the University of Geneva, but also, you know, with WIPO and WTO, we created this IP, um, IP and Innovation Research Revision Network. We met uh, that as an annual conference, and uh, the first one was in uh, Kuala Lumpur in 2019. The second one has been in Jakarta this year, just before COVID shut us down. But the third one, probably actually most likely will be an online conference because um, you know winter 2021 will still be uh, but you know there is a value also to be able to have an online conference because you know people have uh, you know re financial resources are always a potential issue uh, nowadays always and even now more um, for a lot of junior uh, and a lot of women, 
Um, you know, they might have, they might have young kids. They can't really they can't really travel, or they have family responsibilities. They are uh, helping elderly elderly parents, and so. You know, again, there is an, an ability to have access to things through online. It is not 100% the same, but we can do the best. You know, we can really take the best of it and, 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 and transform it in, in, in something that has a very important synergy. So I think, I think you're correct. I'm very happy to know that people were very happy to attend the WIPO University of yes. Summer School. Yes. So... Coming to your area of specialization, and that is intellectual property law. Uh, so the pandemic has brought forth some important considerations as far as IP law goes. Uh, for example, ensuring access if and when the vaccine vaccination comes for important medic medication versus patent protection. So could you please elaborate on this issue as well as highlight some other important considerations as far as IP access and innovation is concerned? Well, you know, the, the, this, is, this is clearly the issue of the moment. Everybody is trying to figure out how to treat COVID-19 and how to develop a vaccine. This is probably the number one priority in our world right now. Throughout every day, Science is trying to find new solutions to problems all the time. But right now, this is a major problem. And access to health has become, has always been there at the forefront of the debate. But now that everybody is involved, and it's not just about people dying, but this economy die, dying if there is no a vaccine, really the issue is becoming extremely um, even more pressing. So then the discussion is, what do we do in terms of access? When we find the vaccine or this treatment, how do we make sure that they, they are given to everybody? And, 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 you know, the question is by, you know, shall we make them public? Intellectual property is whether we look at it as a subsidy or as an incentive for innovation, it's clearly a regulatory system. I am not one of these people who believe uh, that IP is property. I believe IP is um, a regulatory framework um, you know, that tells us something that can be copied without taking away from the originator can't be copied under certain specific rules uh, because otherwise the originator would not create or not invent. So uh, intellectual property is really whether, you know, because in a world where the government invests is the only investor, uh, people would just get everything and there is no need to subsidize or to incentivize because it, there is just public initiative. We know that that's not possible and or it didn't work in the way, you know, some of the theories um, initially trying to develop. So a market driven economy seems to be a more efficient way to allocate innovation and develop innovation. So a market driven economy needs to have an incentive or a subsidy and intellectual property becomes an incentive on our subsidy. But again, that's, to me, why do I say it's regulation? Because it remains a matter of public policy. I'm, I'm making a bit, a bit, you know, to, to say something, um, I, I'm going a bit, a bit you know, I, I'm stepping back to get back in. And so public policy is about public interest. So the incentive given to company X, as I always explain my student, is not for company X, it's because the best work that company X can do is in the public interest. Hmm? But if you don't incentivize company X, then there is no products for the public interest. So how we can find the balance between private initiative and public access by using intellectual property. Intellectual property has mechanism within it as, you know, in case the compulsory licensing, um, there is external limitation like antitrust and so on. We know that greed is 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 a big you know is a big problem. So companies tend to overcharge 
uh, those who want everything for free wants everything for free. And so these two blocks really become the real issue. So certainly the vaccine needs to be given at a fair price um, or made available to everybody, you know, to everybody in the world. But that's ideal. How do we really get to develop a vaccine first, develop medication and actually making it and distributing it in reality, that's, you know, is where the devil is in the details. Um, some people think everything should be free. I don't. I think, you know, if you want to have initiative and, 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 and a certain point, you know, innovation, you need to have, you know, company can know what, I mean, nobody's going to make a lot of money out of COVID. Um, no company is. But to expect that everything comes from the sky for free, and everybody has to pledge everything for free is just um, very naive in my way and just really not possible because company have to make a living and people have to make a salary for, um, you know, to create whatever. On the other side, a reasonable salary is not millions of dollars gouging price and not giving to other people. Like, you now there is a lot of debate, developing countries should have it, developed country will have it, you know, Americans trying to buy all the, all the, 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 the quantities from the UK and so on and so forth. Every government right now is very dysfunctional. Everybody does what they can in their own interest. There is really very poor coordination. I am very, you know, I don't agree about the fact that the WHO, um, you know, I think we need a strong WHO in the world, but this, this WHO is really not fulfill what they should have done. And it's certainly not going to be the, the resolver of any of this problem later. Um, and so how we can find balances beyond the uh, America gets it first or China gets it first or UK gets it first uh, and trying to look at the public interest of everyone, it's very difficult. Um, I think, the, the, uh, you know, many ways, uh, Bill Gates, I know I've been also working with Modi in India, has really tried, you know, to highlight many of the issues. So access is important. IP is important to create innovation through incentive. But the public interest, when I teach IP management, I always teach IP management is about managing IP protection and managing IP limitations. And you manage both because you need to know when you need to have access and exception limitation to protection through compulsory licensing or you know other way to negotiate but the reality is we can't expect everything given for free because at the end of the day company will not invest then the government should step in but we know that then there is other dysfunction when is everything is public there is country I would say, you know, Cuba is an extremely well-run medical services and, uh, and biotech industry and so on and so forth. And clearly it's a country that didn't make it, is, you know, is rich on, on, on intellectual property uh, or on a market economy. So then you, we can have extremely well-run public health um, uh, based on uh, state funding. Um, but that society also has had a lot of other problems. And so, whether it's the snapshot of we need this vaccine, we need this treatment now for as many people as possible, and whoever works on it, we need to put a lot of resources from a public funding standpoint, which is basically people taxes, and trying to develop it for the people, absolutely true. To think that everything should be free for everybody or easy to immediately available, it's like thinking everybody can have their Rolls Royce for healthcare. It's just not possible. Now, how we make this decision, though, is really the crux of the problem. I'm not going to be able to solve it, or, you know, we, we, we can talk for days, but we can't resolve it, um, because now it's still uh, very difficult, you know, and, and it's, it's true, it's sad, but it's very true that people who have more uh, resources will get it first, and that's wrong, but that's the way it would be. Um, so the and and I would not condemn that either too much. The point is how we can try to make sure at the end of the day nobody is really left behind. And uh, and and also because if anybody's left behind this pandemic, 
it's in the disinterest of everybody else because then these people can reinfect other people and so at the end of the day to be fair with everybody is in the best interest of everybody and so i think that's really the way to frame it how can we be as fair as possible within the imperfect situation that any real situation is because reality is imperfect idealists you know like the professor who speak uh, you know, a lot of theories because they have no ends in practice whatsoever. And so practice does require compromise. But what is the least costly compromise for the public interest? I think that's that should be should be the approach in my view. In fact, I I, I completely agree with you too. We, we should view law, the patent law as a regulating measure to prevent, I think, both extremes. That is extremely high prices for the vaccination as well as the other direction that is to promote vaccination for free because as you mentioned the incentivization theory works that way that you have to incentivize creators for creating something so i think that's very important uh, also uh, i think an article written by you in december 2019 i'm just going to read the whole title here uh, it says beyond patents the problems of non-traditional trademark protection for medic medicines and health technologies i think that becomes extremely important i'm going to actually link it uh, while when we release this episode because I think the central premise of your argument was that we need to look beyond patents as far as access to medication is concerned because sometimes other kinds of protections such as trademarks uh, also you know lead to exploitative exploitative measures can you uh, am I right in my interpretation and can you just uh, yes of course tell and, us more know, about the the article that you wrote so I have been working on non-traditional trademarks quite a lot. And so non-traditional marks are uh, the shape of products, the smells, the taste uh, sometimes, uh, the packaging. So things that go beyond the name. And there was a case about an inhaler um, by um, Sandoz, uh, which is the generic. And uh, um, in the UK, uh, Glucso tried to block it based on the, pur the, 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 the purple color of the inhaler even the two were completely different and um, uh, the mark was not allowed um, and so there was a passing off uh, uh, lawsuit eventually but even then uh, justice arnold's really pushed against it and uh, and that really gave me the idea to write that that op-ed but the reason why i did it because i've done a lot of work on non-traditional trademarks um and here is where I think it's important to remember IP in context. Uh, what do we need? So again, back to the greed or the too much free. Because the problem is if we don't reward innovation in the medical industry in some way, and people will just step out and do you know, Botox, Viagra, more uh, Birkin bags or more shoes, or more makeup, just because there's not going to be the ethical issues there. Hmm? The ethical issues, nobody has a right to La Bouton shoes, really. So if you if you you can keep extract values from these non-traditional marks on the soul and soul, and everybody's happy, Bernard Arnault is going to be or he is already number two rich man in the world, you know, with all his uh, bags and purses and trademarks and so on. And who cares about making medicine? because it's such an day to make medicine between regulatory framework and then if you find something really useful everybody wants it right away and then if you don't give it to them for free you are the mean one the evil one where the other ones you know they just make clothes and they are fine but i think here's where you know the, the issue you get we need to say but you know i think there are two issues here so one is how we can how we need to be mindful or of other rights in the medical industry. Um, I've been um, writing a paper that should appear in a book that uh, Professor Carlos Correa and um, Rito Hilke of the Max Planck have edited on a global forum on, on, um, on public health. It was held in December at the Max Planck in Munich and uh, several professors from India were there as well. And, and my paper is about exhaustion of right in the patent world, of course, but also looking at overlapping rights, because sometimes even if there is, you know, exhaustion of rights, so you can move the products based on patent law, you can still try to string them based on, not just on trademark, but on copyright. When we look at some of the registration in copyright at the registry of the Europe, at the US level, Many medicines, instructions, and packaging are, regis are registered. 
um, even though now the regime for exhaustion in the U.S. is all the same. Um, so you can, you know, we need to be be careful about this extra right. And so I was really looking because I start looking mostly in the fashion world and then I move into the, the medical world, um, looking at this differentiation, differentiation of incentive. And then I start looking into these rights and, and how many pills color, pill shape, inhaler colors, um, uh, syringes shapes, uh, um, color of gloves and so on and so forth is actually trademarked. And you know, is that the big problem? Um, well, it's an additional barrier. Um, in all fairness, with one of my students, we are finishing now uh, an empirical search. We have been looking at the top 10 um, pharmaceutical companies in the US and the top 10 medicine by each of these companies by revenues. And in fairness, those um, top 10 medicines are mostly injectable. And, uh, and they are still covered through patent. And those injectables, yes, it might be in out of all these, you know, 10 times 10, so 100 plus medicine. There are some uh, non-traditional trademarks, but in fairness, the real value of protection still stands with the patent. Mm -hmm. uh, the value of protection for trademarks come for the blue pill, you know, Viagra, or um, some of these uh, uh, in inhaler, some of these medicine that are over the counter. So the, the, we are used to pep, Pepto Bismol being, being pink or Advil being blue in the US or, or Tylenol being pink. And so if the store brand can also have the same pink, uh, but for the actual prescription medication that have to be either prescribed by the doctor and filled by the pharmacist, or the, the, the even more expensive medicine that you get in the hospital, the, the, the non-traditional trademarks are far less relevant than I even, I even thought. So now, you know, when we will publish that, in fairness, that's really the result. But still, every additional right is an issue. And uh, even just the trademarks, the name of in the package can become uh, can become an issue for more access. In the European Union, where there is free movement of goods, we had uh, parallel importers um, just uh, using um, um, uh, you know, their name on the package as well. And so that too eventually was allowed under the free movement of goods. Um, but you know, India, India is very, in my view, excellent patent laws for pharmaceuticals, but India is the biggest producer of generic medicine in the world. And India has very strict regulation for trademarks importation because India really doesn't want the Brazilian generics in the Indian market either. So every country at the end of the day makes what is in the best interest for them, for their economy. Um, Singapore is a small country, big, you know, wants to be open market, so has you know, free trade in everything, but when they join the United States Singapore Free Trade Agreement, they have to buy into um, basically a more controlled access for pharmaceuticals if there is a contract that prevents reimportation, that contract cannot be overridden by, uh, by parallel imports. And so I think you know, when we look at all of that, so the more rights, the worse, because you know, when there is more rights, company will try to pull whatever triggers they can. Um, but if I am the lawyer of the company, I will try to pull as many rights as I can. Um, and sometimes, you know, for national interest and point, uh, that might be important because it's not just, you know, it's the medicine, it's access, but it's also jobs, it's people living. And, um, and so I, I long ago stopped to find a solution. You know, it's not one size fits all, it depends. It depends on, on that specific problem, that specific context, in that specific country, at that specific time, I think. Um, that would be a much more, so maybe I become a common law, pure person, you know, like case by case. So I, I believe that, that this was quite insightful and I think it's all a game of balancing competing interests. And as you mentioned, the more the company will try and get more rights and for, for the public interest, that's, that's not too good because then we'll have to balance more rights. So uh, that's, that's quite an insight, insightful answer. So lastly, uh, 
congratulations on your new book international and comparative trademark law i think it will be released in september 2020 and it has been authored with professor jinsberg so can you tell us more about the book so um you know the it's an edited collection and uh, um uh, that i had really um uh, the pleasure to do with one of the the very best uh, uh, professor in the US, uh, you know, my, my mentor, um, Professor Jane Ginsburg. And uh, uh, the collection is because we realized that even though, of course, trademark law, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more an issue, often is a bit forgotten between patent and copyright tend to be uh, the, the top issues of discussion of scholar, but we have a very robust um a trademark tradition to now and uh, there is really no a, there was no a, a book on comparative and uh, international and comparative trademark law um there are scattered things there are a lot of things on trademark but there was not a resource on international comparative trademark law and so we decided we wanted to do that uh, we were very lucky to be able to have uh, some of you know the best scholars um, um, that have collaborated with us, and um, and so the book will be released in uh, in September. Now this book, even though it's international comparative, I you know like every book, it's never going to be 100% complete. Uh, it's still a book that a lot focuses on um, the Western world, but mostly because the trademark laws we know it across the world really is an imprint that comes from the European Directive and the Landman Act. These two, you know, of course the Paris Convention, but then the TRIPS Agreement is a mix between the European and the American tradition. And then from there is where Framework law has been trickling down and really being implemented as within the TRIP standards across the world. For good or for bad, people might disagree with it. Uh, and even the well-known, the, the WIPO recommendation on the well-known trademark is very much a famous mark, mark with, with a reputation, well-known mark, and let's try to sort out what all these defini definitions are. And, and so this book tends to be um, a bit more uh, looking at this history, looking at uh, then you know the the variation of these two big blocks as you know as comparison. Also because a lot of the jurisdiction across the world, common law and civil law, really look at these blocks either because they've got transplanted um, trips and or European style law, or because they look at precedent in common law that are beyond their jurisdiction, but also they look at Australia or they might look you know, at, at the US or, or the UK. And so this is very much a book that wanted to reconstruct all that. Uh, but you know, um, I think you know, we, have a, we have a some on Asia, we have some on Africa. I wish we had a bit more on South America, um, but um, it's no, now I'm working on a, a book on uh, all the trademark law in ASEAN in the South Asia and so the Association of Southeast Asian region just to map it. Uh, there have been lots of changes in the past, even just five years. So it's actually going to be an interesting resource. It's a bit more descriptive. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, this is just a work in progress. After this book, more, more, more scholarship will come. But I, uh, for me, it was very, very interesting because I, um, you know, you keep learning. And I also have really learned from one of the very best scholar. I like to work with people who are um, much smarter than me. And uh, Professor Ginsburg is just like one of a kind. Uh, she's a superstar, but uh, one of the hardest working and uh, most um, really uh, detailed and thorough. And um, it's just the amount I've learned, it's incredible. And so that's why I'm saying, pick your mentor wisely because, and pick people you can learn from. And, and uh, that was a wonderful experience for me. So I'm uh, grateful for every, really every step, for all the collaborators, my co-editor, uh, everybody who supported oh, us. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that this uh, this book 
will be an important resource for trademark lawyers and intellectual property enthusiasts across the world. And it will only be an addition to the fantastic scholarship that you personally have created. And I'm sure that this book has two of the finest professors uh, who have worked on this. So uh, we, we're eagerly waiting for this book. Uh, and, and this has been an extremely enriching conversation for, for us and for, I'm sure, for our viewers as well. So thank you so any that you would like to share. I just want to thank you. I want to thank you, your colleagues, and uh, you know, keep up the good work. I think you are wonderful. Uh, you are very. Um, it's really admiring to see you know students so um, hardworking and enthusiastic. Keep up because uh, uh, because that's really important. You you do a great service, and uh, remember you know to reach out to people who can help you and. Let's try to use technology so we can all be closer together because I think I think that's really possible and uh, and being closer together it's uh, it's something nice. Um, I have a you know as I said India South Asia is a very special place in my heart. You know I've been living in the region for several years now and uh, um, this is a region that has so much you know lots of potential, a lot of growth, and I'm learning every day here. So. Many, many things. Well, uh, again, ma'am, the honor is ours. And I think whatever little success we have achieved till now as, as this, you know, young blog, which is a young forum run by students, it's because of the fantastic professionals that have, you know, have, that have been very kind enough to lend the support and, you know, uh, very, very insightful conversations we have had with these people and scholars like you. So thank you again, ma'am. And all the best for all your future endeavors. We look more, we look forward to more of your work. I'm very grateful again. Thank you.